and we are live. Welcome to the first ever Data Chief Live streaming to you on LinkedIn and YouTube. And what I'm really excited is to be able to connect with so many of you from around the world, including our dear friends in Sydney and Melbourne. I know we've been doing all these events like midday, so we don't get a chance to connect live. Now, if you've never done a LinkedIn Live, what's really important is letting me know that you're actually there. <laughs> and the way to do that is just post a comment in the chat if you're on YouTube or post a comment on um, in the comment section in LinkedIn. We're going to be taking your questions live and your feedback live as we troubleshoot together. And the topics that we'll be taking, I am joined by my esteemed guests. So we'll talk about how to measure success, improve business value. I'll be joined by David Coffey and Andrea Frisk, and then also quick wins with Mike Lampa from Great Data Minds. So that's what we have in store. First, I'm gonna ask you because I said, no matter where you're joining from, bring your coffee if it's the morning or tea or cocktail if you're joining from the West Coast. For me, it's a Thursday evening in very cold New Jersey. So I have my green tea, this cup from a dear friend of mine. So uh, let us know. Hello from San Diego. Thank you, Ryan. And I have to thank my mentor, one of my mentors who dared me to do this, Kate Strachnia host of the Dedicated Conference. It's taught me all I know. Um, and so tell me what's in your cup. What are you drinking? So good to see, good evening, Robert Robinson. Thank you for joining us. Anyone have a good cocktail going? Or is it coffee? I know my friends in Melbourne, is it, the, now I'm gonna forget, is it the Luna Coffee Shop, I think? Hello from Ann Arbor. Thank you, Avani. Great to see you. Albuquerque, New Mexico. So some of you are working the evenings. That's great. Oh, somebody does have <laughs> Dallas, Fort Worth. Darren, thank you. Wait, I thought you were on spring break. What are you doing working now? <laughs> so iced tea. All right, the glass of wine. Who had the glass of wine? It's like streaming so fast. Joe, Joe from ExxonMobil. And I hope all of you will connect with one another as well. That to me is the other big benefit of doing these live, that you can compare notes and best practices. If you're watching this on demand, that's great too. We'll respond to those comments as well. Just to kind of get the fun flowing though, we wanna do a pop quiz. And do you see these beautiful t-shirts? So there's a lot of swag out there, but this beautiful t-shirt made by one of our designers, Radhika Burroughs, uh, the Data Chief, very subtle on the branding. It is the softest t-shirt. And look at these from some of our Data Chief guests in the last year, Bernard Marr, Gustavo Cantone, on the far right, you see the wizard behind the machines of some of the emails that you get from ThoughtSpot, Brendan Ritz Witten and his uh, beautiful son, Tyler. How cute. Ladies, why am I the only one here? I wanna see some of these social media posts with the data chief. Now, to get one of these cool t-shirts, it's gonna go to the first person to answer this question. There's two parts to it. You have to name the movie, and I wanna know the lead female star. Yes, there is a lead male star as well, but I wanna know the female star. Okay, are you ready? It is, a, it is aligned with our theme here. It is legit. Okay, show me the money. Name the movie. And the first, <laughs> so Robert likes the shirt. I'm also seeing my friend Kent online from Snowflake. Thank you, Kent. 
Oh, and we're seeing, oh, Tamta, I was just saying, we're doing this for Patty's Foods in Australia. Welcome. Has anyone guessed this? Oh, you guys, am I showing? <laughs> All right, some of you are guessing the movie. Very good. How about the female star? Anyone? I'll give you a hint. You had me at hello. <laughs> This is terrible. Anyone? <laughs> I can see already. You are so much better at data and analytics than at movies. So we'll give this some time. Oh, I think somebody just got it. Wait, this is going so fast. Susan, I think Susan got it. Susan Meyer, yes. Renee Zellweger in Jerry Maguire, star Tom Cruise. Thank you so much for that. And that is the theme, you know, show me the money. When you talk about how do you measure your success, and this will depend on the level that you're at, your particular range of control. So if you're a BI director, you might be controlling how many users do you have? How many self-service analytics users you have? If you are a data architect or DBA, you might be looking at how many data sources do you have and what are your processing times? If you are a data chief, whatever your title is, VP of analytics, chief data officer, even COO, it's really about the business measures, the KPIs, so the way I would think of this is if you look, I think often of leading indicators and lagging indicators. So when you deploy a data and analytics program, your ultimate goal is the business value. This example that I'm sharing with you is related to people analytics. So employee retention, and your goal might be improve retention for the top performers. Some of those top measures might be improve the employee NPS scores or e ENPS and provide transparency on diversity, inclusion, and equity metrics. That is your overall goal. Having that goal is how you get your projects funded, your programs funded. It's also what excites people to keep aligned to that North Star but that takes time. So your leading indicators will be your enablement. How many people have you trained? What are the weekly logons? Now this middle one, deliver data and the dashboard. This has changed over time. Some of you think about how many hours is your backlog or how long does it take to fulfill a request? How many reports and dashboards did you develop? Well, in the age of AI and augmented analytics, the goal is no more dashboards. It's about the insights. In fact, one chief analytics officer said to me, really, if I do my job well, I won't have any funding because I am funded by how many of these content things I create. But no, they will have funding because they will be able to prove that by enabling data-driven insights, they're able to deliver on that business value. Let me give you another example. So taking something really from um, insurance, this was claims processing and call center, call agents. So again, the ultimate goal, improve customer loyalty. That leads to higher revenues. Improving the NPS scores is part of that. Reducing call hold times improving satisfaction, uh, time to respond. The enabling the analytics stays the same. So let me know what you think of this, and then I'll, I'll give you a couple specifics um, that, of hard business benefits. So if you listen on the Data Chief podcast, for example, um, one, of our, one of our guests talked about how uh, this was Radha, Radha Sankaran from Verizon. She talked about how really they want customer 360 
getting to all of that with some silo data would take time. So they took one of the leading indicators to NPS and just started there, but were able to prove the value and actually measure the dollar impact. So let's see, any comments about this? Or questions? Um, a couple of weeks ago, we were having this debate online and one of you pushed back and said, yeah, but proving the value is hard. I can't quantify that. I can only quantify and get a hard number about weekly active users or number of people trained. And I think this is true in part, but even capturing the anecdotes of business benefits, doing a back of the envelope calculation on ROI is useful. So it's about capturing the stories of business benefits. Okay, um, any questions on that? Is this show me the connection requests? <laughs> yeah, that could be, depends on the use case. Um, next, I'm going to introduce everyone to my colleague that actually helps our customers calculate business value all the time. So David Coffey is a business value consultant. David, welcome. Hi, Cindy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me to be on. Now, David, where are you joining from? I am in Stamford, Connecticut. Uh, Stamford, not quite as cold as New Jersey, I don't think, but uh, yeah. very simple. <laughs> but I'm not hearing, um, I'm not hearing a Northeastern accent. Now, extremely northeast, very much, much easter, much more east. Um, I'm originally from England, but I've been in the states for uh, thirty years now, so uh, okay. it's sort of a mid mid Atlantic accent, I suppose. Good, good. And David, you only <laughs> recently joined Thoughtspot, um, it, joining just before the pandemic, right? But yes. How long you were, were before that? Yeah, I joined middle of February, so it's certainly been one of the most interesting first years at a new company with everything going on. Um, not just learning the role in the company, but uh, all of the pandemic stuff going on. But um, I joined from MongoDB. Uh, I was there for about four years, um, and the latter half doing a very similar role uh, as I'm doing here, and, and prior to that, a, a similar role around information strategy. Um, prior to that, I was with BMC Software for about nine years. Uh, GE for 13 years before that, and then another software company before that for four years. So I've been in the tech industry just over uh, 30, well, nearly 35 years now, I guess. A long time, of an industry veteran. <coughs> well, so we have some questions here. Um, Sonia, yeah, I was going to say, let's bring Sonia's question. What do you do when the business can't articulate the benefits? So really, this is about stepping people through um, the value. And I'll, I'll share with you here too. This was the results of the poll that we ran um, on LinkedIn last week or two weeks ago. The business does want the value. So take us through how you would do this. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question because ultimately, you know, when you, um, it's, it's the business benefits that you really want to quantify. It's, we, we always build, um, productivity measures into a business case because to be honest it's the easiest thing to measure right that you're always going to be saving some selection of roles some time and you you can quantify that but ultimately that's not right really why uh, why we're engaging with customers we're helping them to influence business outcomes um so the the, the structure you have on the screen here really is a a way of walking a customer through um how to get to value right so um, the, uh, the business persona, the second item there is really the most important thing to define is, um, who, who is this person that's going to be using the platform? Obviously this, um, this is a, uh, in the, in the context of thoughts, part, but I think the same rationale can apply to anything. What's the role yeah. of, of the customer? You know, is it a, is it a salesperson? Is it an inventory manager? Is it a financial analyst? Um, the next element is what, are, what insights are they looking for? from the data? What are the questions they're going to be asking? Uh, what are the queries they're going to be doing? What are the pin boards they're going to be looking at? Um, and that's that's fairly self-explanatory. That's fairly obvious. The next one really starts to get people thinking, which is, well, what are you going to do with that? Now that you're getting these insights, what actions are you going to take? If there's no action that derives from it, 
is this really something that we should be pursuing, right? You want to enable people to make better, faster decisions or something like that. And once you have that action, then how do you measure the impact of that action? Is it a time reduction? Is it risk reduction? Is it increased revenue? Is it decreased customer churn, increased NPS, uh, things like that? And then, you know, that's my favorite part because very selfishly, that then gives me that sort of uh, launching off point uh, to start then digging into sort of a dozen levels deeper on the measurement side to really start building out the business case. So I think walking through um, these sort of steps um, really helps the, um, the, the, the sales team, the, the, the customer, the business really think through what is, what are we looking to accomplish here? Um, and when you get into business outcomes is really sort of, I think in three categories. Um, the first one infrastructure is really only sort of relevant if you're um, replacing an existing tool where uh, you know, you've got a certain set of infrastructure that's supporting a platform. And if you are replacing that, then you want to sort of understand that relative measure. So again, one of the least interesting parts of a business case. Um, the productivity side we've talked about, that's something you know always factor in as well. But where you really want to get to is, hey, we're talking about data, we're talking about insights, we're trying to help people make better business decisions. So that's yeah. what you really want to get to. Um, and then it's a case of drilling into, well, what does better decisions mean? And I think yeah. the next slide kind of drills into an example there. Before I <clears throat> hop onto the detail, I want to push back though, because with productivity, be careful. This is where mm -hmm. productivity is a good one. Like you will talk about time saved. Um, on the dedicated conference a few weeks ago, we had one of our uh, customers from Schneider Electric talk about how she saved personally 30 hours a week and the average across the team was double digits but anyone sponsoring it will come back and say what are you going to do with that time mm -hmm. is it, are exactly. you going to lay them off or is it about freezing the headcount doing more with less is Absolutely. that something that you've had pushback on as well Absolutely. And, and and actually, I um, normally in a new engagement with a customer, that's actually one of the first things um, that I uh, bring up is this productivity question. Uh, I remember when I was at BMC, uh, my very, very first exposure to business value consulting, I was not in the role, uh, but we built out this fantastic business case and we walked in and we were all happy. The customer was excited. We did a presentation and there was something like $13 million savings. Um, and we presented it to whoever was going to be purchasing the software, and they they turned to uh, the, the, their the guy who worked for them who built this, and he said, "Okay, that's cool. So I can take thirteen million dollars out of your budget next year." And all of a sudden, the room went really quiet because you, you're absolutely right. Unless you're uh, reducing headcount, or unless um, this, the, the the productivity relates to you know an external consulting vendor or service provider where there's actually money changing hands, a productivity number. Uh, is is not a hard cost savings in a true finance sense. However, so I, I always call that out and say, hey, look, we're going to identify a bunch of time and we can quantify it with a number, but how do we present this? Um, I, I do always push back on the, uh, the sort of the, the sense that, hey, this isn't a real savings because it actually is, right? We're giving people more time and, and time is sort of a finite resource, but it's a question of how do you represent it um, how do you quantify it uh, and making sure you don't necessarily present it as a hard cost savings unless, you know, it, it really is. Um, yeah. But asking the question of, you know, if you had two hours a day extra for free, what would you do with it? Are there projects that you could get to? We were working with a customer uh, that had a pending, I'm sure it was like a $10 million bill uh, for extended support on a platform that they needed to get off of. And we were going to be helping them get off that platform. Um, but by freeing up time in the team, they were also going to be able to dedicate a lot more time to moving off that platform and not having to write another $10 million check next year. So right. those sort of questions, I think, are really, really helpful in really getting to a defensible business case. I think that's good. And here you have, so the hard business benefits, um, you know, time to respond to, or, or ER visits, avoiding readmit rates, um, mm -hmm. cost per patient, things like this. That's what gets people excited. Now, we do have um, some really good feedback and questions here. Um, 
And, and just so people know, for privacy reasons, you can hide your name if you don't want it to appear. That's a privacy setting that you control. We don't control that. Um, while some of the business benefits can be quantified, how do we A, prove the direct impact? Uh, data analytics has these benefits. How do we quantify the contribution percentage um, uplift in demand? David, do you want to take that and then I'll elaborate? Yeah, that's that's hitting the nail on the head. You know, we, you one of the key things in this role is credibility and w partnering with a customer to really build a business case that's solid and defensible. And one of the one of the ways you can lose credibility is by you know claiming that we're going to increase some a customer's revenue by fifty percent or some outlandish claim that produces a massive number that somebody's going to look at and say, look, you know. That, that's not realistic. I mean, maybe it is realistic. It's great if it is, but you've got to be very, very conscious of the fact that, hey, analytics and insights, as the question indicated, is one of a myriad of factors that contribute to business outcomes. Um, so, you know, if we help an organization make their uh, field sales organization more efficient by giving them insights into their customer behavior and sales go up, is that because of ThoughtSpot? Or is that because they did some additional sales training or training. they've yeah, been hiring? Power. So I think being being conservative is a key mantra that I always have is, hey, um, you know, let's say we can have a 1% impact on something. Let's we say we have a 5% impact on something. Being very, very conservative and quite honestly, the proof of value that we do with the customer is where you get the evidence for that. Because quite honestly, anybody can jump into an annual report and Google some numbers and come up with an impressive looking spreadsheet that has an Im impressive looking number at the end of it. Um, yeah. But it's the evidence and the how, how do you get there? Why are we making this claim? Here are some searches we did where we found insights that we could never have found before. Or this is how people can get the uh, answers to these questions that they couldn't before. And having that evidence to back up your conservative claims. Uh, that, that's sort of the, the approach I take. Yeah, a couple other specific things. Whenever you start a new initiative, take a baseline. What is your current? And then you can measure the after. Um, that's where return on investment from my survey days work at Gartner and BI scorecard, less than 14% of organizations actually go back and calculate a formal ROI after the fact. With that said, there are studies out there. I saw Kent Graziano online. Snowflake, for example, did a joint paper with Forrester and had some hard business benefits. Um, a, I think it was just, now I have to keep looking, I forget, 612% three-year ROI. Um, so I think it's taking that baseline. David, thank you so much for- um, You're very welcome. Uh, you will we'll bring David back on in a few minutes when we do kind of a round table, ask me anything. Um, I'll just see if there's any of, one more question we want to pop up. Otherwise, I'm going to bring in our next speaker, Andrea Frisk, now at ThoughtSpot. But mm -hmm. Andrea, I met first last February in person as a customer from Canadian Tire. Andrea, welcome. Thank you. I know it feels like last February is the last time I saw anybody in person. Yeah, he <laughs> like kind of me too, out here in New Jersey. Uh, I did, <laughs> I met two of the team in a, in a very cold day outside for coffee at one point. Um, but Andrea, so for those who are not familiar with Canadian Tire, uh, it's huge brand in Canada. T yeah. Tell people what it, yeah. What, what it is? Yes. It's more than just tires. That's. <laughs> I know. It's bicycles, exercise yeah. equipment. Yeah, it's is it's it kind of a, an everything store, right? So, I mean, there's, you've got home decor ready to assemble furniture. You have pet food. You have tools. I mean, like, it's it was my childhood playground on, on weekends, going shopping with my dad and walking the aisles. Like, I still enjoy walking the aisles and just seeing, seeing what's there, right? It's such a great assortment. But... Um, I mean, it's it's one of Canada's largest retailers um, yeah. with, I, I believe the statement is there's a Canadian tire within 15 minutes of every Canadian. Okay, that's good. Now, so Felix was laughing at yeah, <laughs> more than just tires. More than just tires. <laughs> and Robert was welcoming you. Thank you. Um, 
So Andrea, one of the things that you also focus on is quick wins. And this is something that you had to apply to, to modernize analytics at Canadian Tire. Um, and I loved your model here. So talk us through this model. Yeah. And, and I mean, so the quick wins was sort of just to maintain that momentum. That's the main piece, right? Because you're I mean, we went to take on everything at Canadian Tire. That was our, our goal was to get everyone in thought spot. Um, and every once in a while, you'll get stuck with something that's too complex or you don't have the support that you're needed. And so this matrix is really designed to help you identify value and complexity as a matrix because, you know, you can identify all of the great value. But if you find out that it's going to be like, option a here in the chart where it's going to be really complex you're you're going to spend a lot of time trying to get the data together or get the people together or whatever the resources are to deploy it and you're you're just going to burn through the beginning and you're not going to start to see an, an roi whereas when you start to look at something in the ef range it's high value and it's low complexity. And so this is where you sort of intermix and plan out your use cases as you roll them out and with Canadian Tire, our first rollout uh, was with the merchant group. So the the buyers, the ones who were acquiring the products. And so we brought in, you know, that classic retail data, store, SKU, day, everything that's selling out at a store. So, but obviously the merchants aren't the only ones interested in that information. So what we had, we could throw into the mix as we're working on some of the more complex use cases in the background is we could easily serve up groups um, like our marketing team, who's also interested in the same information, really low value, like really low complexity, sorry, but high value as this is a group that has no access to information, right? They're, they're the, the requesters, the, the, I guess I'll use last month's report sort of people like just not getting access. And so this is really a matrix to get you to visualize and, and sort of plan out your chart so that you don't get stuck boiling the ocean on getting all of the data in at the first time. Yeah, so wait, marketers are working with month old data? <laughs> okay, those four marketing analytics people. <laughs> I thought HR often was the lowest on the priorities for, for budgets, but- Yeah. Um, <laughs> unless you're in professional services. But what I like about this, so that's where, again, think about what is your top line business goal, think of mm -hmm. the biggest opportunity or the biggest pain point, highest inefficiency, high cost, but then easiest to do. Mm -hmm. So data is clean enough, ready enough. What about also they have nothing? Like you mentioned, yeah. marketing really had nothing. Should yeah. you go to a greenfield um, area? So I mean, I mean that that's really where you start to. So there's the value as as Dave sort of talked about. So you've got um, value where it's based on time savings or what's coming in. But part of assessing sort of the value or how well a use case will go is also based on how valuable is this to the users. Do yeah. they have anything now? Uh, right? Like we know that our greatest success is is going to be enabling users and that that full data democratization, right? So making it accessible to more people. And that's one of the greatest features about ThoughtSpot. So when you know that users have nothing, they're currently not being served with anything. Um, and so there's no information accessibility for them, then giving them ThoughtSpot makes this a huge value for them and also reduces your complexity because the users want it you're not pushing change on them right because that's that's the biggest part i i often find in complexity is people right is the change management aspect and whether or not they they believe that this is going to make a fix for them that they believe that this is something that will work or be successful in the long term and so really that that wanting to use it and not having anything just propel it into that upper quadrant yeah, so people change management is a huge thing. You know what? Some things though, we are, we are, I don't want to say we're forcing it on them. If if people have done a good job to uh, underline and understand what I say with them, what's in it for me, 
Mm -hmm. They're either going to say, thank you. You're making my life so much better. As David showed an example in healthcare, ER visits, we want to speed the time to care and reduce the readmit uh, rates. Nurses will care about that. Um, the hospital administrator might care about the cost. So understanding the WIFM, I think, is important here, too. For sure. I mean, this is not the field of dreams, right? If you build it, they will not come. <laughs> so you have to you have to know why. They, why is this going to work for them? Why is it going to be a benefit? And and ultimately, those users, they're, they become, they're your customers, right? And we all know yeah. the customer is always right <laughs> at various yeah. levels. Yeah. Great. Andrea, thank you so much for sharing this model with us. Um, let's see if uh, we have a question from or a comment from Joe. Do we have any data on how much less companies are spending on IT um, versus customized dashboard development? We don't we don't have a cost. What we do know from different surveys is that increasingly the business, is owning that data and analytics budget. I actually think this is a good thing because then the business can prioritize what they want to do. What we often see though is the backlog and you can assign a cost to that. How are you gonna burn down that backlog? Are you going to hire more people? I don't know, Andrea, do you wanna elaborate or anything that you've seen there? I mean, I mean from a standpoint of a reporting perspective um, and an ad hoc request, et cetera, that's just enabling users to sort of to cut down on those reporting requests or to cut out some of the IT needs for other resources by just making the data more accessible in an easy way. I know at Canadian Tire, we started out trying to sort of cut down on the resources that were being needed for monthly reporting by by bullishly saying we're doing these in ThoughtSpot now. This is where you'll get this information. And we we then had pinboard access as the primary mode of information. And then you slowly started to see that users got familiar with it and started to move into ad hoc requests, which you don't, it's hard to sort of quantify that, but you do see that, that those requests then aren't hitting your data team and they're not hitting those data users in the same way. And so those, those requests kind of pan out differently, but again, I mean, having different IT budgets, um, it's complicated. <laughs> yes. So this is where, um, and, and Paola, John, Paola Johnson, our head of community, will post a link to the Wall Street Journal article that came out, and it gives the hard business benefits, same store sales mm -hmm. up year over year, double digits. Even since that article came out, I looked at the year end report, the annual report, also, same store sales year over year, double digits, um, reduction in supply chain costs. And yeah. So well, and that, that in stock position, right? It became so much faster and easier to analyze the information and see what was happening. And at the granularity that the merchants needed, right? So rather than sort of servicing out these dashboards that are typically at a higher level, they're not really going down to the granularity that the specific buyer needs. Being able to layer in all of the data for them just made that enabling in stock and saying, I, this is when I need my product. This is when my season actually starts and really getting that forward sort of helped drive Canadian tires, especially with COVID dropping. So, I mean, I always say, thankfully Canadian tire had it before COVID. So we're allowed to make a lot of pivots pretty quickly with, with easy access to the information. Great, thank you so much, Andrea. And she will be back shortly. Next, I wanna introduce uh, my next guest, Mike Lampa, co-founder, chief analytics officer at Great Data Minds. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Cindy, how are you? Good, now, Mike, <laughs> Thank you, you for bringing me on. on. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure, thanks for, for joining, and I'll explain why I asked you to join um, on this topic. But Mike, where are you dialing in from? I am in Dallas, Texas. Dallas, yeah. Texas, mm -hmm. warm and sunny. Yep, yep, as you can tell. I, yeah. I gotta <laughs> start putting some sunscreen on. <laughs> no, no, I'm admiring your, the, what's on the shelf behind you. Um, oh, the, that is uh, South American folk art. 
uh, my partner has a hobby in refurbishing those. And so oh. it's just all over. I mean, I could start spinning my camera around. I'm, I'm surrounded by beautiful artifacts. Yeah, uh, cool. I love uh, it. Um, right. So, and Mike, we were debating, I thought, I thought I met you at TDWI 10 years ago, but it was actually before that, wasn't it? Are we allowed to clear? I, th I think it was kind of, co-partner we we met at twi when you were doing the bi scorecard and then i said hey you know what i'm trying to get dell to figure out how to buy the right bi tool so okay. i got them to subscribe to the scorecard with you yeah great and you also were at honeywell as well so you have worked from both sides as mm -hmm. a consultant a strategic advisor but also a practitioner yes I've always been a practitioner, yeah. sometimes as an employee, sometimes getting out from the dark side. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I, I say I'm going to the light side. <laughs> we can get from the dark side. Um, and by the way, coincidentally, today is my two-year anniversary on this dark, bright side. Oh, congratulations. That's awesome. So, of course, we, we have to kick it off with the high-stress live event. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> but the reason why I wanted Mike to join is because uh, working with one of our customers, interestingly, Andrea just used this phrase as well. The mm -hmm. text was, uh, we were trying to boil the ocean, chase everything at once. Mike and Julie mm -hmm. at Great Data Minds got us to focus on an initial quick win, uh, mm -hmm. not go after everything. So I think that just is a good reinforcement about this approach of quick wins. Mm -hmm. It is. And and, and um, there's a couple of things that, oh gosh, both David and Andrea said, you know, um, from the quick win standpoint, I loved Andrea's point of view around find the value that you can deliver most quickly. Um, and, and we take a very lean approach and the editorial approach, but the lean approach is, has this economic value point of view around it. And one of the concepts is find the value that you can deliver the most quickly. So it's called wait as shortest job first. Um, can I deliver incremental value where the complexity is not that big and then compound upon it, right? And as opposed to trying to boil that darn ocean. And, and that's what we had to take um, with, with the customers. Like, no, we can do these minimum viable products and do it continuously. You know, that's the whole lean and agile approaches. I want this continuous ideation of the next thing that produces value. I got to figure out how to vet that value. I need to use some techniques around design thinking. I have mm -hmm. to use some techniques around behavioral stories because I want to understand What's the behavior I'm going to influence with this analytic, right? What's the value I'm going to produce by influencing that behavior? And then what's my intentional uh, vehicle for measuring that value? So, Because I have to build tele telemetry in along with the analytic itself. Um, and then the last piece is in order to get that value, because I've done a bunch of vetting of the data, do I have the right entitlement, et cetera? Um, the, most important piece is many times as an industry, we keep dropping a ball on making sure we understand how is the business going to integrate this analytic into their business decisioning process and their day-to-day -day process execution, especially if I'm optimizing internal business processes. Um, if I'm focusing on embedding analytics into my products and services to my customers, then I have to take a more of a design thinking approach and understand what is that customer need. Do a divergent approach to really understand it, you know, get the voice of the customer, whether it's empathy interviews or, or customer surveys, and then bring it back together. So I have a, a good comprehensive view of the need and then drive out the design iteratively, continuously, you know, yeah. learning. So there's a few points there um, just to drive home or re-emphasize. Design thinking. Now, you refer to design thinking if you're creating an external facing data product, but do, I think it also applies internally. As well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, when I was at Honeywell, we, we, we were supporting um, analytic demand from our 
internal business operations around sales and marketing and, and customer experience, as well as we were embedding IoT uh, uh, centric uh, analytics into the hardware that we were selling to our customers in the oil and gas field. Um, and but the design thing still came down to who's the customer, who's the stakeholder, what's the stakeholder map, how are they going to use the analytic, um, can we get buy-in on how they're going to integrate that analytic. And all that has to be very deliberately defined up front and then vetted, do we have the right entitlement to the information to get after it, test the hypotheses, and then start to drive that into the solution with the telemetry behind it. Great. Now, so let me ask a few people attending, are you using design thinking as you develop these data products? Let me hear from you. Let us hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I want to clarify, so really you, you, Great Data Minds, and you use this model for the full data and analytics lifecycle, including upgrading, migrating to a cloud data warehouse, Mm -hmm. also deploying augmented analytics, also deploying predictive and mm -hmm. embedded, right? Yep. Um, yes. Yep. Yeah. So the couple things that we're trying to change the dialogue around is how do we help our customers be future ready, not future proof, future ready? Because as you know, Cindy, um, thoughts about being a classic example, the technology capabilities versus what we used to deal with 20 years ago are amazing, right? Um, yeah. So, so how do we figure out how to start to encapsulate our data as an asset that we can keep migrating around to the best enabling uh, technology platforms is one thing. Um, the other thing is uh, making sure that as we're understanding where we want to go, what is that continuous approach to enable the strategic direction, especially when the st strategic direction has to change because of world events. And we got a classic example, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, so many people woke up to this inflection point. It's like, wow, we got to start to future ready ourselves. Right? So we're trying to figure out how do we, how do you get on this continuous Everything's continuous, continuous innovation, continuous adjustment of strategy, continuous alignment of our delivery of the, the quickest win to value, right? Given the market signals and rhythms that we're feeling right now. Right. Yeah, and that's where being agile, um, yeah, it's, I remember a comment from Tom Massafero from the CDO of Western Union. He said, now is the slowest point in your career ever. Mm. I think everyone's super busy anyway. But I also think this goes back to because things change so quickly and because leadership may also change, that is also why you need the quick win. People mm -hmm. have moods, enthusiasm, um, they, or, or priorities will change if you don't deliver those uh, quick wins. Oh yeah, yeah, and we have to market those, right? Um, and we have to make sure that that value that we're producing via actionable insights is actually driving back to an outcome that links to the strategic direction and contributes yeah. to it, right? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna share a quote from Monik Baer, uh, the head of analytics and insights, or sorry, Monik Gupta from Baer or Bayer, if, if you're European. Um, mm -hmm. of analytics and insights. Um, and he said, agility triumphs over perfection. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days when you could take six to 18 months. It's now about two to six week sprints. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Relevant. Yeah. But not everyone agrees. Um, so uh, Sonia is saying in a big, and Sonia is joining us from Australia. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> in a big organization of 40,000 people, it's possible, but not when we're bringing data in from 400 critical business systems and making it available for the advanced analytics. What do you think, Mike? Um, so I'm, I'm curious what it is that's not a quick win, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing anything fast, maybe doing mm -hmm. anything fast. How would you parse that, parse that out? Well, you gotta, you have, I think, 
um, and we keep preaching to our organization, you got to break it down into the functional units of the organization. What are the business processes internally we're trying to optimize? Can we zero in on those? Can we find, how do we move it? How do we optimize an outcome from a business process? Yeah. And how do we build upon that, right? Um, yeah. when, when, when I was in Honeywell, I mean, that's a big old company, but there was also these small agile teams that were focusing on functional areas. And there was a larger 300 person team that was focusing on the customer facing um, um, IOT advanced analytics based products. Yeah. Great. Good. Thank you, Mike. So mm -hmm. what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring um, all our guests back on and see if there are any um, final questions. This is kind of the ask us anything. Oh, there we go. The ask me anything is there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and go ahead and type it in the comments. Okay, Kent, ask what is the MVP to get started with? As we have said for a while, don't boil the mm -hmm. ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in that, that MVP can sometimes be that highly relevant data that that's kind of like the center of your data core that everything in your organization might touch in at varying different mm -hmm. levels, right? And that's how also with big organiz organizations, you tend to have this one data piece that's really the core and everyone has their little connection points in it. So when you start to map out how you're gonna tackle everything, you can get those quick wins by starting with that base data and and establishing okay well what's the extra ad what's the extra ad that we need to make to bring in these new pieces and you're slowly building on something so that you've got a you've got a bigger system going on and then you know eventually you you have boiled the ocean but like not in a bad way yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> okay you yeah you, you boil yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 the ocean <laughs> little little pots then, and we're pouring yeah. it back in yeah uh, you know and the first one percent of change and it might be and this is again across the whole life cycle your first one percent of data in the cloud mm -hmm. your first one percent um on self-service it's one group one function your first one percent for predictive and then rinse and, I, and repeat go back yeah and i i think andrea you, you know you shared that quadrant of uh use case prioritization you know that top right magic quadrant of that that combination of uh, a use case that can deliver tangible business value but is also um on the simpler side to implement either because yeah. the data is already available or it doesn't need much modeling or whatever that whatever simple means in that context um because one that means that you're you're not slogging away for 12 months to get your first mm -hmm. win but it also means you're not just jumping in and getting a win but there's no value associated with it you're finding that sort of just right um you know goldilocks type use case but i think by going through that process you by definition are coming up with a series of use cases and you've now all of a sudden you've got a, an adoption pipeline so you right. hit the first one to um to deliver value as quickly as you can but you then also are taking steps down the line to then expand based on the learnings that you have in those first one or maybe two use cases yeah and if i could uh pile on on top of that um couple things that we need to get better at as an industry is sensing the market rhythms because they are changing and they're going to con continue mm -hmm. to change at an accelerated rate so that we can pivot as quickly as we can towards those right things that are going to address uh, an opportunity in the market. And the, the, the other feedback loop is the riptides that are coming from the delivery teams from underneath that they, they're on to something based on their hackathons or whatever it is, we think we're onto a new idea. Can we continuously try to explore and innovate on these new ideas across the business functions? Right. Yeah, good. Um, so <laughs> just the, fa the fantastic four. <laughs> <laughs> They're like uh, those superhero Marvel comics. 
I don't know mm. anything about superheroes. I don't know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, my nerdy, nerdy background. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll end with one last question. Yes. So from Sonia, what type of metrics could you use for data democratization and data literacy or data fluency? How does this translate to dollar value? And, and I, 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 maybe I'll start. This is where look at those enablement metrics, the leading indicators. How many people have you trained? How many lunch and learns or coffee chats have you offered? And then look at how often they log on. Data fluency or data literacy is almost you're going to have to do a qualitative assessment. I loved, I, I wish we could get this customer to share this. They actually gamified, we gave them business questions. Um, and had them gamify it, did they get the right answer? Mm. Anyone else want to respond? I could offer up, um, there is, um, so Ben Jones um, has been pioneering some some data literacy things. Um, and there are 17 traits uh, that have been identified and you could baseline that and give yourself a health radar. And then from that baseline, you could establish where do I want to move the needle and the, the traits around behaviors and attitudes and, and technical proficiency. And all of that is like edu- education and collaboration, you know, community-based kind of things um, that we have to continue to expose to the business. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree on, on it's really one, like Cindy, what you said, like it's you're looking at enablement. So how is this changing user behaviors? What are they doing? How are they accessing it? And all. And that community piece as well, though, right? Like, how are we now collaborating more effectively? Mm. What new things are we bringing to the table? And I think it is less to say, well, we've brought this in, we've democratized data, and thus it's X amount of dollars. Um, But it's like, well, would we have had this idea? Would we have come together in this way without this? Would these conversations have been possible? And so I think those are the pieces that it it is hard to quantify, but it's not it's not hard to ignore, right? They're Mm -hmm. they're there. They happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've seen. I've actually seen a customer build a uh, a business case around. Uh, you know, thinking back to Andrew, you were talking about the the adoption, um, the adoption uh, metrics of customers mm-hmm. using pinboards versus answers. I've seen a customer attach a value to every search, because the 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 assumption there is if I have a a business a frontline business user that's getting an insight into something that they can use in the business, there is inherent value in that. Can you put a specific dollar and cents value on it? Probably not. But this customer actually said, hey, let's say it's $10,000 that every valuable insight that a, that a knowledge worker ga- gains is worth 10000 mm. well, How, how much would it be for, for every meeting that executives didn't have to have because they could get the answer in the meeting from ThoughtSpot, right? That's even more value. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, in yeah. real time, in real time. But I do think this is where consumption-based pricing in the cloud um, you know, it takes away the risk. No, no shelfware. I have to share this from Susan Meyer. It's amazing how many projects don't track users trained. I will tell you, I still have my silver dollars. Think Moby Dick. This was my first pro- pro- program project manager back in the mid nineties from Dave Kepler, who went on to become the CIO at Dow Chemical for every hundred users trained. He gave us um, a silver dollar and (laughs) those. So so, um, listen, everyone, I I promised that we would just go till 10 to so that everyone has that break before the next meeting. Um, I'm going to thank our wonderful panelists for joining. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone, for attending for all these great comments. I'm going to pop up. One um, final slide, save the date. So I'm saying the first of the month, always, we want to do this. We're going to make this a habit. If you read James Clear, Atomic Habits. Mm. The only reason why we did this first one on a Wednesday night is because it is Thursday in Australia and and Japan, and I didn't want to lose people on Good Friday. So make this a habit. The next topic we'll take is really people change management or cloud migration strategies. You tell me. So far in my one-on-one calls with CDOs this month, it's been people change management. 
I also want to point out, we are hosting our first ever ThoughtSpot APAC user group. Paula Johnson, our head of community will be there. Great speakers, April 15th, please register for that. If you have not listened to the Data Chief podcast, we release new episodes every two weeks the, on a Wednesday. Listen on all your favorite players and just recently added to YouTube as well. Um, and the, the last one, we did a, a season recap, an end of season recap. Um, that is the highlights from the year. So listen in to that. The first one of the new season was co-founder, chairman of the board, Ajit Singh, uh, join from your favorite podcast player. Again, I thank everyone for joining for the very first Data Chief Live. I wish you a great weekend, whatever holiday you're celebrating, and we'll see you, we'll see you soon. Thanks everyone. Have a good evening. Good morning. Good day. <laughs>